Jadi watak dua. VHS 94 was really the original brainchild of David Bruckner uh, working with Radio Silence. I think for them, you know, looking back on the VHS franchise, you know, uh, David was fairly involved in the first film. He, of course, directed, uh, wrote and directed the segment Amateur Night, which is one of my personal favorites. Thank you. You know, I'd, I'd worked on a couple of VHS films prior, uh, the first two, and I'd never been able to do a segment before. And I always wanted to do a very contained uh, single location thing. How I became a part of VHS 94. I think it was through Josh Goldblum, who did a film festival, a Cinepocalypse in Chicago. It was actually our US premiere for a, for my first film, Low Life. And uh, we kind of stayed in touch from that. And he contacted me through that. And I was initially brought in. And actually, it's funny. I knew uh, David Bruckner from Atlanta. We, we both grew up in Atlanta and, or came up in Atlanta. And when one of the segments came free, I pitched uh, Terror to, to to do and shoot. And they everybody liked it. And Brad Miska, God bless him, was like, yay. And then we did it. So <laughs> I got involved pretty early on I think way back in the day like a few years ago they were putting the movie together and they were taking pitches from some filmmakers so I went in and I think I pitched a couple ideas to uh, David Bruckner and um, for whatever reason they decided to hire me and, you know with the flashlights and, the, yeah, and get all this stuff in here you know before we right and then there's like a bang bang bang, bang. Right. Petro was that you? So earlier this year, Josh Goldblum contacted me and said there was an opening for um, for a director for the wraparound for VHS 94, and would I be interested? And you know, I said, let me think about it. I mean, on the one hand, I was really eager to get back to work after 2020, you know, the year of not <laughs> not making anything. But I was also real curious to try to see if I could insert myself into something like this, you know, the VHS franchise and you know, a horror anthology. Uh, both of which have a really um, uh, wide fan base, and both of which are on some level sort of much more conventionally horror than the films that I have written and directed previously. There's lots of projects that I intuitively quickly say no to, and this was one that I, I just kept thinking, and it was a very short period of time that I said no, but it was a, you know, my instincts were telling me that this was a project that would be a really, um, you know, would be a really productive, um, co you know, sort of um, collaboration, and so far, so good. Frame and action. Police! Police! Search warrant! Police! Search warrant! Police! Great. Cutting. I came on board, like, late 2020, and uh, right after... Um, and I believe it was Minnesota, uh, a bunch of militia guys were going to kidnap the governor and behead her on national television. Like I, I tried to kind of ask myself when I was writing it, like what's my fear and what's sort of scary going on now? And then it was sort of born into reality like while we were still working on production. You know, events kind of like took, I mean, I was talking to Pasha, one of the producers on it. Uh, we were like working on production stuff the day like you know, they were storming the Capitol. I think we had a meeting with James Sled, our our uh, our uh, effects, our special effects guy, uh, like scheduled for the day that like they were storming the Capitol. Okay, why don't we cut to commercial? Oh. Jesus fucking Christ! Oh. 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 Where the fuck did I come up with this idea? I don't know. <laughs> it just came to me. I'm just gonna use that. <laughs> you can just use that. You know what, I, I think I came up with the idea for Storm Drain because there's always been something especially terrifying to me about people walking into these kind of small, confined spaces. Um, in any horror movie, whenever you have that kind of scene, like, it's hard for me to handle. So uh, thinking about the idea of someone walking straight into a storm drain, you know, only to encounter this kind of creature uh, deep inside of it felt kind of classic and um, also something that really freaked me out personally. So I wanted to try to do a segment that uh, starts fairly stationary and, and gets more and more kinetic. 
as it builds. And um, so, you know, starting with the camera mostly on tripods, that's why we've been working so heavily to figure out what our shots are because the audience is gonna live in them for a while. So when I found out that another VHS film was happening, I kind of was ready. When Josh asked me to, to consider the project, I got two I got two scripts. They were vastly different, both involved uh, a SWAT raid of some kind of a drug lab, and there was the a, a sort of a, a <laughs> the kind of a slight smell of cult involvement, but none of those threads were um, were sort of like fully fleshed out. And I had coincidentally just a few days before I got those scripts watched David Cronenberg's Videodrome, which I had seen before, but I hadn't seen it in a while. And so what was really fresh in my mind was, you know, this the sense of um, TV as a as a kind of hypnotic drug. Also the idea of the danger around something like underground, unrated, you know, video production. Josh sent me um, a whole folder of locations that had already been scouted. And there were some great options. I, I looked, you know, first one, second one, third one. I think it was the fourth one that was this um, place called Digital Canaries. So based on the based on those the pictures, I actually wrote the um, the wraps, the sort of the kind of wrap locations in that warehouse based on what I saw. So one of the first pictures that I saw was of a literally like a broken in half airplane, a broken in half full size airplane in the space. There was a room that was full of church pews. There was a room that was full of overstuffed comfy TV chairs. So um, I wanted each one of the wraps to kind of land in one of those spaces and have some encounter. I think probably because I was really just eager to, um, you know, to write something and make something, I really dove in and wanted to make sure that um, that this, the, the VHS 94 wraparound was substantial and thoughtful um, and took into consideration the other shorts and maybe did something that the wraps in um, not just other VHSs, but maybe other horror anthologies hadn't hadn't done yet. Oh, the yeah, it was done. Okay. okay. Oh, well, wonderful news. That is a wrap on the entire oh, wrap. Yeah. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you. Shooting found footage for the first time has actually been really good. It's been really challenging in some ways because I'm used to you know being able to cut around things. Uh, and definitely in found footage and in single camera found footage, um, you really sort of have to nail it. I think what I've enjoyed the most is actually the speed at which we can go. And usually when you make a movie, a lot of it, you're just kind of waiting around. And there is something about just being able to be shooting pretty much from the moment you start until the end of the day that's really exciting. It feels like it brings this kind of energy to it um, that's really different. I have never shot found footage before. Um, and I love it. It's, there's a, a pace to it that's really different. Uh, you're not sort of stuck in a scene for nine hours getting coverage and um, it's, it's really fast paced. There's a lot of improvisation. Uh, so creatively, it's really, really fun. Shooting in the storm drain was very exciting. There's no substitution for it. It's truly the best production value you could ever get. It looks incredible. I didn't realize that the city sort of has this whole system beneath it, so it really added to the creepy factor of this whole project actually being inside of it. There was a, a part where I had to sort of walk into the darkness and keep walking and everyone was behind me and that really freaked the crap out of me. <laughs> Once we kind of got into a rhythm, it felt like we were all on this little adventure together. So I wouldn't go back in, but it was cool. Yeah, I, I hate shooting found footage, and I and I really hope to never do it again. Like I really, I feel like the last time I ended up working found footage, I was like, I'm never gonna do this again. Um, and like, and then I, I'm always like, oh, but there's that one like kind of creative thing that I can do. It's almost like theater. Simon, you know, always talks about that. So you're sort of on all the time. There's no, you know, delivering your lines and walking out of frame and just sort of like uh, stopping. I think it's gonna. Uh, scare a lot of people. I don't even know if I'll be able to watch it, to be honest, even though I'm in it and I'm here and I see, you know, how it's being made. I think it's going to be crazy scary. Again, I wanted to do a very contained horror story. And uh, coincidentally, there was a global pandemic. Um, and we ended up filming this movie during it. 
and you know to to find a safe way to create a COVID build bubble during production, we all ended up staying and filming in a Holiday Inn, which is where I am currently. For my segment, I was really kind of like, okay, I can shoot in a Holiday Inn, no problem. It, it's more just about like what do the rooms look like and how can we get like water in there and such. Uh, so you know, this is my first time really just like doing a really complicated build. So what audiences actually see in the wake, our funeral home is one pre-existing wall of a Holiday Inn. And then they're seeing basically three fake walls, um, one of which with windows on it, which is going out to kind of our special effects arena to create the effect of the storm. So the wake set, oh, it's so sick. They just did such a stellar job. Um, it really looks like a funeral home and even being in there, because for a lot of the scenes, it's just me. I, I, I feel secluded. I feel like I'm in a funeral home. Uh, they built the set from scratch and uh, it's just so cool. And the rain and the lightning, it, it feels real, you know, which is really what we're trying to get across with this found footage, so yeah. So we wanted a tornado to come through into our funeral home and uh, to achieve that, we're gonna candy glass uh, everything, bring in two of our giant air cannons and uh, debris, rubber glass, dust, cork, balsa wood. And uh, on a three, two, one, we're just gonna send it all in uh, into the set and bust as much uh, of the set as we possibly can. I've not shot found footage before. Our approach to this, which I'm really excited about, like I'm a student of uh, the VHS films. So when I came here to Canada to get ready for the shoot, um, I put it like a photo of the each director from each segment of each VHS film on my mirror, a la Rocky IV. I've been training in the snow. I'm here to like make the best VHS segment that's ever existed in the, you know, in the atmosphere. And each day getting ready, like quarantining into like, you know, prepping, whatever. I take one director's picture and I crush it in my hand off the mirror. <laughs> I have not shot an entire work that is found footage. I wasn't intimidated going in, going into it by any means, but it's uh, and I, and and I find it actually um, really liberating in the sense that you you set up this whole you set up the room and you set up the whole shot uh, and you sort of choreograph it through and then you shoot it a bunch of times and think editorially where you can. Um, you know, where you're uh, making sure that um, the coverage can meet and match. But it's really about the, the choreography between the performers and the camera. There's a freedom to shooting that I, that I really appreciate that sort of moves the production through faster. And I'm, I'm finding it pretty, pretty liberating. So, I mean, you know, I don't think this will make my, my, uh, my last found footage project. Shooting a COVID, it's, uh, it's interesting. It feels like, I mean, definitely it creates some additional obstacles. You know, things become much more complicated that probably wouldn't be as complicated in non-COVID times. But that being said, I feel like the essential kind of energy and rhythm of the set is the same. You know, people are wearing face masks and distancing, but um, it still, you know, it still just feels like making a movie at the end of the day. I think it's the first time I've ever done something like this, so I'm still processing this. I, why can't we just do this like every week? That would be awesome. I'm kind of a silver linings person, you know, so I think everybody's eager to get back to work, and I do think that these, what we've learned um, shooting under these circumstances is something that we have to be able to look at as something, you know, positive to, you know, to move, to move forward. And I've had a really, uh, you know, I've had a great time um, shooting shooting so far um the the 14 day the 14 day quarantine was was interesting it was totally fine um and i got a, a lot of work done and it was interesting but i'm also um, eager to to return to my family and firing three that was nice we're going all out for this one simon barrett coming for your ass it's like a kid's dream come true we're doing planks and uh, mortar fire and we're blowing a rabbit up uh, so Phoebe, the rabbit, yeah. um, we decide to inject her with the blood of the creature, which is radioactive, and to see if our mission will be successful. So the idea is we inject the vampire's blood into the rabbit, 
And when the sun comes out and hits the rabbit, it'll detonate. Um, we aren't aware, however, how large that explosion is going to be. It's probably blocked by the tree or something. You get in there. Don't be such a fucking... No! Movie blowing up, I should say. Phoebe <laughs> the rabbit is like the love of my life. No, no Phoebe's harmed in the making of terror. Oh, no. <laughs> like ran out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the special effects on this are out of control. We got uh, Patrick McGee to build our Ratma creature, and it's honestly one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. Um, that process was really awesome. You know, I worked with a concept designer named Keith Thompson who created this incredible, disturbing, creepy vision. Uh, and then Patrick was the one who kind of, you know, brought it to life. And just watching that creature from you know the beginnings of that build to the final product um, was really was just eye-opening and we also have a, a good old-fashioned face melt which is really awesome Okay. <laughs> so with these memorial videos, isn't it usually just like home movies? We record our services from time to time. Yeah. Our lead in The Wake is uh, Kyle Legend, who's playing Haley. She's pretty much on screen for the entire film until she's not. And, and uh, you know, it's all local talent in this project. Uh, Kyle is someone who I, I'm gonna just go out on a limb here and say that I think she's great and filming with her went really well. Yeah, working with Simon has been incredible. He's super kind and down to earth. And um, this is my first horror movie and it's just been so lovely. And the set is so great. It's not what I expected for horror. I don't know. I thought it would be like so scary and stuff like that. But, you know, he's been really great with like guiding me and sort of leaving it up to me to be free and, you know, improv a little bit. And wherever I feel Haley with her character, like where she, what she would do or how she would react. He's always like, just you do it, like feel free. And it's been great. I'm really enjoying myself. What was interesting when I got, when I signed on to the project, there was a cast in, attached. That cast sort of drove the story, you know? So I really thought like, I want to rewrite this rap to feature these two women of color who we meet in the midst of their unit that's just full of very sort of macho men, you know, and they, over the course of the rap, really flip the table um, on that dynamic. But the other cast um, attached are also fantastic and, um, you know, with a kind of a range of um, a range of experience. You know, I watched everybody's audition tape and sort of did a little bit of research um, uh, in terms of what their experiences were and really at least tried to, you know, tried to to create characters within this unit that on the, on the one hand seem sort of ar archetypal, you know, there's the, the really sort of like mansplainer, there's the kind of goofy cop, there's the, you know, hardened um, captain, you know, and then there's these two, you know, rogue uh, cult leaders. Well, I'm really excited. We've got like, um, like a bunch of really cool local actors are shooting in Toronto and they're all uh, here to kind of like, we're, we're, we're forming like, you know, the militia itself is kind of like, they're all kind of gelling and coming together and we've done cool uh, readings and we've done a bunch of um, uh, like one-on-one -on -one meetings and everything. And I don't know, like I'm, I'm really excited about like, what the actors are going to bring to it and uh, how they're going to make, uh, again, this shitbag militia come to life and we're the, <laughs> tear the fuck out of them by the end of the movie. Uh, Ryan was amazing. I mean, he has an amazing eye for, for picking the right people. And to have that, that trust in us and also the trust that we can place back in the director is sadly rare. But we all just commented on how fantastic his vision was in order to allow us to play as much as we were able to so our cast is incredible uh anna hopkins is playing holly she has been such a dream to work with she's a really really strong actor and she just brings the best energy to the set I and mean, we're asking her to like you know go into storm drains and and get dirty and get covered with like blood and bile and um she has just been game for all of it <laughs>
Uh, working with Chloe's been great. Uh, she's got a really relaxed, but yet like really knows what she wants sort of demeanor on set. So it's an, it's a really nice energy to be around. Um, and she she I like make, she likes to laugh, and I and that's always like a nice thing to hear on set. So she's made a really really nice environment for everyone. And then we have our cameraman, Jeff, who is played by Christian Potenza. He is a character. He brings so much energy and spontaneity and fun um, to the set and also just to his character of Jeff. Her constant just sort of like, that was great. That was great. That was great. And just like vitamins for my for my actor ego, right? I'm just like, yeah. And I think the, the funnest part for me is watching the two of them together riffing off of each other. Um, and they're really, they're really good at it. Uh, even when they you know, go off script, it's kind of like they're staying in the moment. And it's a relationship that's full of affection, but also um, you know, that sort of brother-sister thing where they annoy the crap out of each other. What do you know? I think it's a very exciting project. I think, you know, Shudder and, and our partners on it are, you know, I, I respect them for letting us do this this way and, and kind of commit to the technical authenticity of the period and, and what this film's going to look like, because I think that's what's really going to help it stand apart is no, like the way the way video technology of 1994 looks hasn't aged the same way that like Super 8 or 8mm or 16mm has aged, where we have a warm nostalgic feeling with these old uh, analog mediums of our youth, VHS just looks horrible. And, and you could film, you know, the most beautiful person or thing in, in the world on VHS and it would look ugly. Um, unlike Super 8, which is like almost the opposite, like it, it beautifies things. Um, for the most part, it softens things and, and so on. Um, VHS clarifies just like only the ugliest aspects of whatever you aim it at. And so it is a wonderful era to explore, uh, you know, in a horror movie. But, you know, but again, you can't cheat that sort of thing because um, then you, I think, I think audiences are savvy to what the real thing looks like. VHS 94, well, if I can make a bold statement, I think will be the best VHS. Aside from the, it taking place in 1994 and uh, theoretically being shot uh, with um, analog footage, I think it's pretty... Uh, there's a wide range of uh, gnarliness um, and uh, a, a wide range of, um, of, of villains and, and slaughter. I think it's probably the most complete, complete VHS in the sense that all of the shorts have, have a um, pretty substantial plot in addition to the gnarliness. I'm really excited to be a part of this. I feel like it's such a cool franchise I've been a fan for forever and it's a really cool uh, kind of loop around from you know making movies in Atlanta kind of around the same time uh, Bruckner was coming up and and we're here now making VHS 94. Um, yeah I think VHS 94 it's it's been kind of crazy for me personally just because I'm coming on to a team that includes Simon Barrett and Timo and David Bruckner as a producer. Um, so I think it's just this truly like incredible group of filmmakers um, who have really kind of, you know, given the power to just go ahead and create something, whatever, you know, craziness like lives inside of their mind, unrestrained, which is always really exciting. Um, so yeah, just being a part of that has been pretty amazing.